Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, the uh, Health, Medicine, and Bioscience Edition. I have uh, Frank Ryan, uh, He's an emeritus consultant physician with uh, Sheffield Teaching Hospitals and affiliated to uh, Sheffield Medical School, the fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of England, fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine and of the Linnaean Society of London. Um, currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Medical Education, University of Sheffield, in the UK. And we're going to be talking about viruses. Uh, Frank wrote a book called Virolution, which is fascinating. Um, and it's rare that... Uh, Scientists work with viruses, except maybe if you've, uh, you know, seen a movie or two, which probably is not very accurate. So, uh, Frank, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I look forward to the, uh, the conversation. Yeah, how did you, uh, you described it in the book, but for listeners, how did you first get involved with the world of viruses? Well, to be honest, the first research I ever conducted on viruses was when I was still a medical student. And this was on a type of virus called a bacteriophage virus. That's a virus that eats, supposedly eats bacteria. Actually, it's a virus that's symbiotic with bacteria, but that's something we'll come back to shortly. But essentially what I did is I injected rabbits with a bacteriophage virus. Now, this virus wouldn't cause any illness in the rabbits because the virus only infects, if you like that term, bacteria. But as far as the rabbit was concerned, a rabbit is a mammal, of course. And what I wanted to see was how did the mammalian immune system respond to a virus arriving into the bloodstream? Now, virtually every time we get a virus infection, some of the listeners mightn't be aware of this, virtually with all virus infections, the virus finds its way into the bloodstream. So this was an interesting and important experiment for me at that very early stage in my career. And essentially, I, I found that the... Initially, there was no Im immune response at all, of course, but gradually it went through phases of immune response with an antibody called IgM first, and then IgG, which is a very powerful one. By the time, after, say, about 28 days after the initial injection and a booster injection, the level of antiviral defense in the rabbit's blood was absolutely fantastic. Within a matter of maybe half a minute or a minute, uh, Viruses at the level of 100 million per mil would be inactivated. So the, our immune response is from, uh, uh, powerful given time. And of course, that's another important thing, because one of the things with viruses is all this vaccine hoo-ha about measles and so on. And yet, when we vaccinate people, if you think about it, what we're doing is we're preparing the immune system to respond to a virus if and when that person ever encounters it again. And it is linked to what I was doing in that very simple experiment right at the very beginning. Having said that, I then became, when I qualified in medicine, and I became a consultant physician in the teaching hospitals, which meant I dealt with medical emergency. And I, I went away on holiday once, and then in the this is about late 1980s. And uh, when I returned from holiday, there was a young lady on, in a side ward. She was isolated on uh, one of my wards. And when I went to see her, she looked like a Belsen inmate. She was really grossly emaciated. She had temperature up in the clouds. Every test done on her, and she'd been in for about a week, all the tests done by my junior st doctors had, had proved negative. And the only question she asked me when I was examining her am I dying, doctor? Now, she was, clearly, but of course, I didn't say so. And I, I, I took, what I did is I took one of the team away and I said, look, repeat all of the basic tests. Now, do them now. And at the end of the ward round, I go around all the other patients. I'll come back to this bed again. And I want to see, have we found anything on the test? Now, every test had been blank up to then. But when they repeated the chest X-ray, the picture I then looked at, what they call a wet film, showed if you looked through a window and saw a hailstorm outside, that's what I was looking at, at her lung field. That gave oh. me the diagnosis. You know, that could only be one thing. And the one thing 
is blood-borne tuberculosis, what they call galloping consumption. It's the same illness that killed the two Bronte sisters, and it usually kills within a week. Immediately started on treatment in a triple therapy treatment, and within five days she had a normal temperature, and she went on to make a complete recovery. It was just that happenstance of seeing such a dramatic case, and I present, we had staff round. We used, every, every week we, we'd go around the different big hospitals in Sheffield, and someone would present an interesting case, and we'd all discuss it. In fact, it was my turn, and I presented the case to this young woman, and I turned to the doctors in my audience. Some of them included uh, chest physicians and infectious diseases doctors who'd been around practically from the time of discovery of the cure for tuberculosis about 30 years earlier. And I asked them, how was this cure found? And there was no answer. Nobody replied. And I thought, is it possible? Is it possible that the discovery of the cure for tuberculosis hasn't been described? That's happenstance. That happenstance led to my traveling around the world for two or three years, speaking to people who had been involved in the cure. And I wrote this book. It's, it was called, in Britain, it was called The Greatest Story Never Told. And in America, The Forgotten Plague. It was book of the year for the New York Times. <laughs> and while I was researching it, one of the guys I went to meet was Jack Adler, who was head of the Bureau of Tuberculosis in New York at that time. New York was in the middle of a TB sort of minor epidemic and including drug-resistant tuberculosis. So I got to speak to him and discuss the difficulties that people were having and what he was doing about it. And we went out for a meal in the evening, and he said to me, I like your book on tuberculosis. He said, have you considered uh, writing a book about emerging viruses? <laughs> now, other doctors here in Britain and elsewhere, when I went to speak about the TB story, said exactly that. And I thought about it, because AIDS was on the rampage, Ebola was a big problem when it happened, and so on and so forth. But there wasn't enough there, really, uh, for me to get a handle on it, to see how could I approach a book like that. And then Jack, I had an evening meal with Jack and his wife, and he said to me, if you're interested in emerging viruses, this now was 1994, he said, go down to the four corner states, you know, you know where they are, and you'll be in the middle of an emerging virus. You will find yourself right at the heart of people dealing with an emerging virus. It was called the Sinombre Hantavirus. And that's what I did. I went down there and I met people and something quite extraordinary happened. And I'm looking at these little things I sent. I've sent you a picture I actually took of two chaps in biosafety gear. Uh, this is, these are American doctors in the four corner states uh, fighting the hantavirus. And then I've shown you a picture of a young lady holding a deer mouse. The, the, the host of the American Sinombre hantavirus, which killed young fit people within two or three days, wow. is the deer mouse. It's the deer mouse. And then I met this chap, and there he is. Can you see the picture I sent you of Terry Yates, who who's, unfortunately is no longer with us? What, yeah, Terry for Yates, listeners, uh, you sent me a, a series of slides that we'll, uh, yeah. we'll make available. But yeah, I see it. Yes. Okay. You see that Terry Yates. Now, he's one of the brightest people I ever met. And the reason I met him is because he had been studying the deer mouse for years in its native habitat in New Mexico. And in speaking to him, I was at, he was explaining to me that the, all the rodents on Earth, every rodent on Earth has its own hantavirus. And that astonished me, see, because my attitude to viruses was the typical medical attitude. They're the cause of disease. They're uh, uh, basically parasites. Genetic parasites was the term that was applied. Still, some people still call viruses that. And so for him to tell me that there's some other kind of a relationship between the hantaviruses and the rodents, I asked him what disease that this hantavirus caused in the deer mouth. And he said the hantaviruses don't cause any significant disease in the rodent house. What they do, he said, is they co-evolve with them. Now that I stopped I was only going to spend about an hour with Terry and go on to other people who, who I was speaking to. And that stopped me dead. I actually stayed with him for a while in his home. I visited the, his base. You know, he, they had a place called the Servietta where they were studying everything in the most incredible detail, including they had corpses of little deer mouse going back 100 years from which they could extract them, viruses and all that. And during our conversation over this, I, I said to him, are you saying to me that the mouse is influencing the virus's evolution, and the virus is influencing the mouse's evolution. And you know what he did? He shrugged. <laughs> I said, because if that's the case, if that's the case, you're describing 
what in sort of ordinary biology would be called a symbiotic association. And basically, he couldn't answer that. Now I went home thinking about it, researching. Now, there was no Google in those days, but there were ways in which you could kind of search the internet and elsewhere and medical and scientific papers. And I tried to find somebody who might have any knowledge of viral symbiosis. Uh, it asked a question. I was already now asking myself a question, what is a virus really? Is it what we medics thought? Or it could be this rather more to the situation. And then I discovered that Joshua Lederberg, who is the president of the Rockefeller University and a Nobel laureate for work done in um, DNA, he'd used the term symbiosis in relation to the old virus that I studied as a student, the bacteriophage. I wrote to Professor Lederberg and said, could I come and interview him? And he said, well, I'm very busy. He's the president. You can imagine how busy he was at the Rockefeller. But you know what? He yeah. said that the guy who gave him a job and first gave him an opportunity, do you know what he was called? Frank P. Ryan. <laughs> really? <That's laughs> which is my name, which is my name. So that, was, yeah, yeah, that yeah. gave us a great, we actually laughed about it. But he did agree to my seeing him. And he, I gave him what he called the toughest interview of his career. It lasted a, an entire afternoon. The reason why it was so detailed is because I realized that if he confirms my suspicion, I'm going to be going on to something entirely new. I'm going to stop what I'm doing and move into a completely unknown field. And I asked him, are viruses symbionts? And he said, well, in relation to bacteria, sometimes they definitely are. Then I said, could it be viruses that affect mammals or animals and all sorts of other things could also be symbiotic. He said, I couldn't answer that. He said, but it would be very interesting to find out. <laughs> yeah, and this is one of the big concepts of your book is that viruses and phages can endogenize and become part of the DNA of the, yeah. the creature that they're initially attacking. That's Isn't right. That right? There's, yeah. there's, I think there's always been more to it than what we medics assume. Now, many people still think tend to see viruses as just parasites, but a parasite actually parasitism is included in symbiosis. But symbiosis included other things, and I'm sure one of the slides I sent you describes that. It's not about Mr. Friendly Guy who shakes the hand of this friendly lady and everything's hunky dory. Actually, symbiosis is a, is about survival in what Darwin called the struggle for existence. Because if you get two, two organisms, two, two life forms, or more than two, in a relationship in nature, if a single one of them can benefit from that relationship so they have a better chance of survival, then that changes their evolution. It has an influence. And that's if, if only one of them benefits at the expense of the others, it's a parasitic. If one benefits and it doesn't cause any harm to the other, it's a commensalism. But if two or more benefit from the situation, it's a mutualism. That's the definition of symbiosis. So now, that's what I now was now beginning to look at in the world of the virus, okay? So I've got some, um, I got some questions here. Um, you speak about AIDS, you know, HIV being a... Yes. Uh, possibly yeah. a co-evolutionary event. How could that be? I thought AIDS just well, that, that, people. That, that's it. The, 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 at this stage, I began to look at something that happened in the rabbits in Australia. You, you know all about myxomatosis. You remember the rabbit myxomatosis? I remember it happened oh, no. as a child. Now, in Australia, uh, European rabbits were taken to Australia in the 19th century as a food, basically, and hunting and so on. But the rabbits overpopulated the landscape of Australia because there were no predators, no natural predators of them. And the result was there were millions and millions of rabbits everywhere. And so then the Australian uh, biologists had the bright idea, we'll take a virus from the Brazilian wood rabbit, which is known to be lethal to the European rabbit. Now, in nature, what would have happened is the Brazilian wood rabbit would have come into the Australian landscape with its virus. And the virus would slate wipe the Australian rabbits and the Brazilian wood rabbit would take over the ecology. That's a kind of aggressive, what I coined a term, aggressive symbiosis, because what the virus is contributing to its host is not aggression to the host, but aggression to rivals of the host within the same ecology. But actually what happened is they injected, uh, say, 30 or so rabbits and released them out into the wild. 
Nothing at all happened for a while. But then there came the rainy season, and actually the myxomatosis virus is spread by biting insects. And the biting insects proliferated in the rainy season. Then something quite extraordinary happened. 99.8% of the rabbits in a landscape the size of Western Europe were dead. 99.8%. That's how lethal the myxomatosis was. But 0.2% were still alive. <laughs> Sickly, but still alive. If the Brazilian wood rabbit was there, it, it would have occupied everything. That would have been the end of the, the European rabbit in Australia. But it wasn't. So what happened is over about 20 to 30 years, the rabbits that had a genome that was a little bit different, the part of the genome that deals with infection, the major histocompatibility complex, uh, the virus has now chosen a tiny minority type of major histocompatibility complex in relation to itself and it, this this rabbit is resistant to the effects of the virus. So what have we got now in Australia? Australia is repopulated by rabbits. The rabbits have their own myxomatosis virus. And what is it doing? It's co-evolving. And now if we get onto that AIDS thing, it's unbelievable. Because what I was saying is what I'd realized now is that I'm trying to get to the picture. There we are. I'm looking at the picture now. This is a, a HIV-1 choosing its partner. Really, what you're getting when AIDS, when the AIDS virus, HIV-1, is hitting the human population, was it, what is it actually doing? Now, this paper that was written about this, you can see there's an enormous amount of contributors because this is a multi-center, very big trial and a big multi-center trial. And when they looked at what's influencing what, they discovered that there's a t particular type of HLA-B allele, that's a gene, of the major histocompatibility complex in humans, and selection pressure is being imposed on the presence of that gene by the HIV-1 virus. Also, when they looked at it from a different point of view, they found that the HLA-B gene frequencies in humans are likely to be most influenced by HIV disease. In other words, if this had been allowed to go on without medical intervention, what would have happened is there would have been a change in the human histocompatibility, histocompatibility complex genes. And that change so what, would, have been, would have been imposed so by the HIV virus, but also the virus would have been influenced by the human H in its, in its evolution by the presence of the different types of HLA-B genes. In other words, you've got the same situation as the hantavirus in America. The HIV virus is changing, would have changed the human genome. So to, make this, genome. to make, this, make this clear for listeners, the virus's path yeah. typically may be kill most of the given creature or species. They'd the ones the that ones survive. That weren't compatible with them. They'd kill the ones that okay. weren't compatible. And the then one, the ones that were, the one that was. the ones that were compatible, were they compatible before? You know, were yeah, yeah, they, they would be a very minor. Because right. the, the yeah. virus has made them so. No, well, what it is, is that if you look at the big population, the human population, there are different variations in the, in the gene pattern. And what the virus is doing is it would be picking a minority group within the whole of the human population. And eventually that group would become the entire human population. So the virus is changing what's called the human species gene pool. What gotcha. the point I'm making, point I'm making is viruses, there's more to viruses, in other words, than simple parasitism. It's much more complex. And what they're doing is they're choosing the long-term co-evolutionary part. What, what happens when um, a virus endogenizes inside of a creature? Uh, does that, that does that does it come out later? Like you know, if, no, this, this from is what I learned. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, this is a particular one. Well, onto the retrovirus. Now, retroviruses they're very small viruses compared to the coronaviruses and retroviruses are both RNA viruses. Now that's something very special. We're not RNA creatures. We're DNA. Our our genome is composed of DNA which is a very stable compound, but it isn't very reactive. RNA is like a system molecule. I call it the Cinderella system molecule. It's, it's, the RNA is also capable of storing the memory for life. It has that capacity, but it isn't as stable as DNA. But RNA has all sorts of other properties that DNA doesn't have. Now, one of the most important properties that RNA has is that if you've got a, let's say, imagine a landscape in which there were polynucleotides. Okay, that's why, that's basically what DNA is, a polynucleotide, but much smaller molecule, say a molecule 30 nucleotides long or 50 long or something like that. 
if that nucleotide was DNA, it wouldn't be able to replicate. It would need an enzyme called DNA polymerase, which is a very complex enzyme, which would have to evolve in order for DNA to replicate. But RNA is capable of being the enzyme for its own replication. Now, if you think of the beginnings of life from uh, organic chemicals, the only possibility of a genome, a protogenome, if you want, that's only made up of a sort of chemical strand of, of uh, RNA, RNA would work, DNA wouldn't. This is why people believe that the, at the, right at the very beginning of life, and probably it was in the vents, you know, on the bottom of the ocean, miles down on the bottom of the ocean, is where they think this happened. If you go down to the deep sea vents now, you know, you can go down to three miles or so under the Atlantic Ocean, and you've got this enormous pressure and very high temperature. Believe it or not, it's pro there's a vast proliferation of viruses, but well, they're not the viruses we see higher up in the... They're, they're a different kind of virus. They're resistant to those very high temperatures. And those viruses uh, are symbionts of bacteria and also something different, something that looks very like it isn't. It's called an archaea. That is the name. You can imagine what that name suggests. We think it was the first ever cellular life form. And though those viruses right at the depths of the oceans in those vents and around the vents. Those viruses are, the old term that say parasitize the archaea, what I say is they're symbiont archaea. Now, if, if you take RNA, which if you construct RNA self replicators, say you do it in the lab and you just make them, or you do a computer simulation of an RNA self replicators and you give them the property of RNA, something remarkable happens. Other little replicators hitch a ride. They come in, always happen. They come in and they hitch a ride on the self replicator Now I think that's the origin of viruses. It's something innate in the nature of uh, uh, self-replicating uh, RNA molecules that something uh, that looks think... like a parasite will hop a ride, hitch a ride on board, join in with it, detach from it and take advantage of it. But actually what I would say is it doesn't just take advantage of it, it changes. It. Right, but do, do you, so, okay, uh, some general questions about viruses. Do you think that they are alive? Do they have agency or they have contingent agency where only when they enter into a yeah, bacteria well, I, or a cell that suddenly they are? Well, I, I, I th the first thing about viruses, if we want, can we define something that has to be a virus and couldn't be anything else other than a virus? And the answer is yes. I do this in my new book, Virusphere. I actually did it much earlier, but I, I've, I've only put it into this book called Virusphere. And what I've written it into scientific papers, but what it is, is the first thing about viruses is the non-cellular. Now, all of the definitions of the tree of life and the definitions of life are only referring to cellular life. They didn't take viruses aboard at all. They just considered that the only form of life has to be cellular because it has to have the enzymes to do its own chemistry and all that sort of thing. But actually, what I'm saying is viruses, when they're when the virus is actually acting as a virus, and that's inside the cell of its host, is a, a kind of life form, but it's A, is non-cellular. What does it do that no other life form does? It codes for a capsid. A capsid is the thing that wraps the virus, viral genome and keeps it safe inside the virus. And the capsids can be made of, you know, these things that look a bit like diamonds and crystalline structures, that, but they're not, you know, they're actually proteins. But that sort of thing, that crystalline structure, that's the capsid. Every virus has a capsid. So we can say every virus is non-cellular. Every virus must code for a capsid to contain its genome. But there's a third ingredient. And now you're beginning to see why that was so important, going to talk to Joshua Lederberg and Terry Yates. Because what I came away from that was with the notion viruses, every virus is a symbiont. So we've got non-cellular, capsid encoding, obligate symbiont. People will say viruses can't be alive because they can't replicate without the assistance of the host cell. Virtually everything on Earth is like that. Where would we be without oxygen in the atmosphere? All the oxygen in the atmosphere is created by life. It doesn't come from chemical processes. It, it's a side effect from photosynthesis. We need... Uh, essential things, essential fatty acids, essential vitamins, all this sort of thing. Where do they come from? Other life forms. Where we eat meat, we eat plants. Where is that coming from? Other life forms. To say that a virus can't be a life form because it depends on the host, 
for the uh, chemistry uh, or the genetic chemistry to replicate everything on Earth other than something called uh, the, the very simple autonomous bacteria uh, which can live on an inorganic sort of uh, subs substrate are the only things on Earth that can live without other life forms. Everything on, on, on Earth depends on other life for its cycle, for its life, day-to-day -day metabolism and so on. Viruses are not exceptional. The fact that they depend on the cells of the host for replication is not exceptional. Well, question viruses, here, so, so are viruses that kill uh, the thing that they infect, are they just failed symbionts? Well, well I think that no, if the if, if you observe the behavior of viruses, the, the numbers of viruses that kill like that are relatively small. The vast majority of viruses in nature don't do that. If a virus kills, like smallpox is the most uh, dramatic example of a virus that kills, because it killed more of its host than anything else, but even smallpox didn't kill 100%. And that's a virus that is, that is over on the parasitic extreme, if you want, of that symbiotic spectrum. It is a symbiont because it's still dependent on its host for survival. But if, for example, what happened when people were carrying, most of the people in Europe developed some resistance to smallpox. So when the European settlers went to the Americas, often they were carrying smallpox or the clothing was contaminated or whatever. If the Native Americans got it, it is devastating. So you could say that the virus is operating with its host in a way, a very clumsy way, <laughs> rather like we saw in the Australian rabbit, but nevertheless, the host is benefiting from it. Even even a virus that is extreme like that uh, may have a some vague sort of benefit. The tendency with most viruses, there are some viruses that don't move along the symbiotic spectrum. They always remain as parasites in that sense. And we just accept that a minority of viruses, that's that works best for them. What we've got to realize, what is controlling a virus's evolution? There's only a single thing, and that's evolutionary forces. Nothing else matters. And the evolutionary forces, forces are uh, spread, replication. Anything that helps the virus to spread, anything that improves its chance of, of infecting more hosts and more replication, natural selection will say that's what matters, and the virus will evolve along that way. If you think of it, think of a virus moving into a new population like this uh, coronavirus. There will be little subsets of viruses all the way through the population that it's advancing into. And all the little subsets will be slightly different. The viruses, they evolve at an extraordinary rate. So there'll be some that are more malignant than others. These will kill more, these will kill less. These will be better at getting into the host. These will produce more of themselves and so on. Whatever of those subsets works more efficiently to produce virus, spread virus, and replicate virus, that will be what emerges as the dominant virus. It's controlled by so, evolution. So when a virus endogenizes it, when it becomes part of its host DNA, does it yeah. still, is it still a separate entity? Is it a part of the host it now and does it act? Uh, you know, that, that's actually, that's a, that's a really good uh, question, I think. Because people from a neo-Darwinian perspective were a bit reluctant to accept this symbiotic perspective. There isn't much. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm sort of over-egging this a bit now. Because these days, if you go to an evolutionary meeting, you'll find people who are symbiotic. Symb you know, people studying symbiosis and people studying neo-Darwinian evolution standing next to each other doing presentations and so on. There's no argument now that evolution is a much bigger thing, basic uh, sy uh, uh, symbiosis or Neo Darwinism. It's well, that's good. includes it all. Seem to it be. In, it includes, seem to be, but that's good. Well, it is because I I I, I presented evolution meetings and it doesn't matter. And in our discussion, we talk about the different aspects. Some people, I, I've actually spoken to university professors when they invite me in to give a talk and say, "Why are you teaching people that evolution is only about mutation plus selection?" When you know it's actually much more interesting and complex. And you know what they say to me? They say it's easier, <laughs> easier to teach because it's so simple. Right. Well, that's, sure. I think that's stupid. That's absolutely stupid. But so, what are your thoughts when when a virus well, yes, endogenizes? Yes, well, what well, endogenous. The, the only up, up to now, I th I've all, I've thought for a long time that a lot of other viruses besides uh, retroviruses much, must somehow change the genome of the host. And I've just read a paper recently where people are finding that happening. But let's stick to retroviruses where we know it happens. Now, the reason why it happens in retroviruses is because the way in which a retrovirus replicates, even though it's got an RNA genome, it has its own gene, uh, reverse transcriptase, 
which converts the virus RNA into DNA. Then when, it, when the virus has changed itself, its genome into DNA, another viral end, enzyme called integrase fires the virus genome into the host chromosome. But it does this, not, it doesn't do this normally to the egg or, or to the sperm. It does it in the, in the target cell, which is usually a, a lymphocyte or one of the cells in the immune system. But unfortunately, set, some retrovirus over the history of our human and pre-human uh, sort of evolution have done exactly the same thing into the germ cell. And the result is you get a whole, sp there's a huge number of retroviral insects in our human genome. It's a massive number, We're talking about hundreds of thousands of retrovirus inserts. People, <clears throat> people used to say, well, they're just viral insects, they're junk. They, they don't belong there and they're not doing anything. Absolutely wrong. Because some time ago, about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago or more than that, now I've, I've, I've given you one of the slides to describe that, that uh, someone discovered that a, a gene called syncytin-1 in one of these retro, a single one of these retro inserts on chromosome 7 codes for a protein called syncytin. Syncytin is vital to the structure of the human placenta. It makes all this, the surface cells in the placenta fuse into a single monolayer. And if you think of it, that's vitally important because you can't allow the maternal immunity to get through that placental barrier if the maternal immune cells or, or antibody could get through that barrier, they'll kill the fetus because the fetus, half its antigens are from the, from the father, which are alien to the mother's immune system. So we know now that we knew that from then that syncytin one was a uh, which is derived from retroviruses uh, is vital to the human placenta. In fact, now we know all of the mammals have a type of syncytin one virus. It's different viruses in the different mammals, but there's a virus that's doing that fusion syncytin one function. And what they did is uh, some scientists constructed a, a way of, of blocking syncytin one expression in mouse, in a, in a pregnant mouse. When they did that, the fetus was aborted. Then they discovered another uh, syncytin called syncytin two, which sits the protein that's coded by syncytin two sits just below the barrier layer in the placenta. And this one actually fights the mother's immunity and stops it from coming through. Now those function, that syncytin one function, the syncytin two function, are not uh, sort of viral genes that have now been domesticated. That's what the Neo-Darwinians call it, domestication. I don't mind the term domestication if what they, they're saying is the viral gene is now used and the viral property is now used for the good, if you want, of the host. That's true. But if they think that the viral gene has, been, has actually been changed into a sort of human gene, they're absolutely wrong because the property that that viral gene retained is the property it acquired as part of its viral evolution. Do you see the point I'm making? It, isn't, it hasn't well, become so a new gene. It hasn't become a new gene. It's the same gene that was originally in the virus. The only way it's advantageous to the host, to the placenta, is the fact that the viral property of fusing cells, we can't do that. A virus can. So it does that as now for us in our evolution. So, all right, if you say it's been domesticated, you mean it's now used by the human uh, organism, if you want. Yes, I'd say, yes, that's absolutely true. But people seem to think it's been changed into a, some different kind of gene that's now been used, and that's not true. It's actually the same oh, gene oh. as you find it. Have, has it been observed ever that um, endogenized viruses will code under certain conditions for our own cells to produce more viruses? I mean, it happens during no, no, a viral no. infection, but with no, that no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't do that. If it did that, it would become dangerous for the host. And if it happened, I mean, if that possibly could have happened during the evolutionary time frame, but if it did, it, it wouldn't have been. Uh, it wouldn't have been favoured by natural selection. That it actually I introduced another very important kind of topic, concept, sort of concept, is that what happens, what does nat how does natural selection deal with the fact that you've got uh, two different evolutionary lineages in the same genome, which is what we now have in the human genome? How does natural selection deal with that? And the answer, selection, the, the coming together of two genomes through genetic symbiosis, which is what we're talking about here, I, I, when we talk about symbiosis working in nature, 
the, com the, the partnership of the symbionts is called a holobiont. And what I've, I've coined the term holobiontic genome. That's what we've got. We've got a holobiontic genome, which is made up of parts that came from viruses, parts that came from our own mammalian uh, evolution. And how does selection come to terms with that? And I've been trying to think the way out of that, discussing with people and so on. And basically what we think and what I've suggested is selection will now accept something that contributes to the survival of the holobiontic organism. If, if it enhances survival, it'll be selected for. If it does it better than what was there before, it'll be selected for. If it does it worse, it doesn't enhance it. If, if it, if it uh, sort of risks survival, it'll be selected against. Now we've got examples all the way through the human genome. For instance, the genes that codes for, one of the genes that codes for globin, and the, you know, globin's a vital protein in our blood, hemoglobin. Uh, three of the four regulatory aspects of the globin are now have been replaced Viral regulatory systems have replaced, replaced the original mammalian regulatory uh, sections. And the reason for that is exactly what I've been telling you. The viral regulation works better than what was there before. What happens, select, that'll be selected for. So it'll, it's selected for what was originally a viral, but that's now working as part of the whole biome human genome. It doesn't matter now to selection where they came from. All that matters is do they enhance survival or don't they? And it's very important to grasp that. Now, something else was well, discovered. Well, one quick question. So, when a, okay. when, again, well, when a virus endogenizes, do you think there's a yes. loss of agency by that virus? And now it's just a part of this new holobiont. Mm -hmm. It's a one, there's, there's well, one agency, there's one creature now. Well, I can, no. tell you what hap I can tell you what happens when an, a virus endogenizes. It's now in a germ cell. And, and when the germ cell becomes, you know, the gamete and then it forms the new individual, that same virus will be in every cell in the new individual because the genome is inherited. That single germ cell, the genome of the fused germ cell, you know, when the ova and the sperm uh, fuse, that the genome that's formed by that and the part that comes, let's say the ovum had a virus, the, the ovum part of now what becomes the genome of the whole uh, new uh, organism, it'll just, it, that will be shared by every single cell in the body of that new organism. Occasionally, a viral expression in an organ somewhere will do something important, and then again, natural selection will kick in, and that will be inherited. But something else was discovered. Initially, all this was found in humans. They found that the human syncytium 1 and syncytium 2 were shared by the great apes, but no one else. So in other words, these viruses must have entered the genome at the time before the great apes separated off into the four, you know, humans, chimps, and orangutans, and gorillas. But then they found, when they started to look, and this is very recent, they started to look at every mammal on Earth. And every mammal they looked at had syncytium 1 and syncytium 2. Then I remember discussing this with a professor up in Glasgow, and he's, he, was, he was still saying, well, I think maybe a placenta evolved, and then the virus has improved on it. And I thought, well, he could be right. Maybe that's what it is. But then these uh, people in France, only in the last decade, started to look at uh, you know, uh, various other sort of people. They, uh, marsupials, you know, don't have placentation, but some of them have a very short-term placentation lasting a few days. When they looked in those, they found syncytin, a syncytin molecule. And in their genome, they also found a syncytin-2 type molecule. And the other discoveries by this same group have now absolutely and definitely confirmed that the viruses were there at the very beginning of placentation. In other words, the viruses contribute, contributed the ability to form a placenta at the beginning of the evolution of the placental mammals. And I can quote you the final line of their paper, capture of a founding syncytium by noviparous ancestor was pivotal for the emergence of placentate more than 150 mil, million years ago. In other words, we have retrovirus to thank for the fact that we have pregnancy and placentation, which is an absolutely vital thing in humans. Yeah, so viruses are a, a major guiding hand oh. or an invisible hand of evolution. Well, that's true. And then you, you can't then say viruses are genetic parasites because they have given, they haven't just taken from the host, they've also given in a huge way 
the host. Now I can tell you something else that viruses are doing in nature. People have asked me, what, what would the world be like if there were never any viruses? Well, if there were never any viruses, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> and the second thing is, what would the biosphere be like? Uh, they, they've been, for about the last 20 years, a, bit, a little bit more, people have been studying the oceans. And they found, you remember the same virus and bacterium that I studied as a student, bacteria virus and bacteria, and also archaea. The oceans contain, are full of bacteria, archaea, and other very small single-celled organisms. And every one of them has this bacteriophage virus. And got, what happens, you get cycles where the bacteria multiply and produce large populations. If this were allowed to continue in the ocean, can you imagine what the oceans would be like? They'd be fetid soups of bacteria. You wouldn't dare to put your foot in it. <laughs> but those bacteria have their own bacteriophage viruses. The viruses multiply inside the bacteria, and at a certain stage, all the bacteria burst, they pop. So there's massive cycles of bacterial replication and then huge wipeout. These cycles of life and death in, back, in the bacteria in the ocean are central to the, uh, the food cycles, if you want, the nutrient cycles of the ocean. So if you took the viruses away, you'd wipe out the basic step of all the nutritional cycles in the ocean. Now, something else has been discovered. This, this was discovered about 10 to 12 years ago. But then in, over those last 10 to 12 years, people, including Marilyn Rosink, who I, I know quite well, who has been studying viral symbiosis in plants. And other people, in this, in, particularly in America, have been studying what, what soil. Could it be something like this actually, is actually operating in soil? And everywhere they looked for it, they found these vast, I mean, you're talking about astronomically vast numbers of viruses in soil, even in the Antarctic. They're everywhere in the soil. And it ha the studies of soil haven't gone as far as the oceans yet, so they haven't studied, are these, does this constitute the basis of the food webs in, in soil as well as in the oceans? But my guess would be, uh, the, that the answer to that is going to be yes. So uh, viruses, I don't know. I mean, are you saying they're a food source or that they're the um, they're not they're a food the driver source. of... Uh... No, drivers, yes. They're not a food yeah. source because they, they, the viruses themselves don't provide any nutrients. But what happens is they allow the bacteria to multiply and then they destroy them. And in the destroyed bodies of the, of the bacteria, which are now in the water and I would suspect in the soil... That, that destroyed bacterial substrate is providing all the basic nutrients. You were talking about basic chemicals, uh, small sugars, all that sort of thing, that other very small microscopic organisms then feed upon. And those microscopic organisms are fed by bigger organisms and so on right up through the food chain. So right at the very basis of the webs of the ocean, uh, you've got the virus. It's the interaction between the viruses and the bacteria and others and, and archaea. And it's it's a very aggressive interaction. So you see the use again of uh, aggressive symbiosis that it, what the viruses are contributing is aggression, but they're also replicating. So through the replication, they, they, the viruses are released when the, when the bacterium pops. But when the bacterium pops, it releases all of its goodness, if you want, th that would then supply very basic level nutrients uh, to the sea. If they, if they weren't doing that, those nutrients would be used up and the sort of cycles of life, if you want, would be interrupted. <clears throat> well, when a, uh, the, the, the a bacteria not doing any, dies, though, I would—I th mean, I would think it would just naturally decompose anyway, and the nutrients would be available. But well, bacteria you think don't naturally help cycle bac nutrients. No, no, bacteria don't naturally die. Bacteria are immortal unless something kills them. <clears throat> they just keep replicating. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yes, they oh. replicate, keep forming more bacteria. The bacteria, the daughter bacteria, are identical genetically to the paternal bacteria, they just keep producing, they keep budding, reproducing that way. And they'll just keep doing that unless something interferes, either the substrate they feed on if, if they, or something kills them. Really? So viruses are critical to uh, preventing an overabundance yeah. of bacteria? The viruses oh. are critical. They're, they're not, they're critical to what's called the nutritional, the basis of the nutritional webs of the oceans. And isn't, I'm not saying that. It isn't, I haven't come up with that. It's, this is, these researches have been done. The people who've 
who could, they're largely, again, American scientists who've been studying the oceans over the last 20 years. But uh, in the book, I give the references so people can look them up themselves. That's amazing. Wow. And that's that's not so virusphere. That's virusphere. Uh, huh. That's virusphere, yeah. not virulution. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Huh. Where yeah. would we be without viruses? We wouldn't have the placental mammals. And if there weren't viruses in our uh, the biosphere, well, the base of the biosphere would be wiped out. So... Again, they're playing a very important role. So I, I, I think to describe viruses simply as genetic parasites is, is foolish. It's, it's completely misunderstanding the role. And I suspect people say, where did viruses come from? I think, you remember what I said about the little things that hitch a ride, even if it, when it's just self-replicating molecules? I think it began with that. And as life de- evolved into cellular life, it evolved together with the symbiotic viruses. And we know now we've got numerous examples of viruses contributing to hosts and hosts. And what they're doing is viruses carry genes into hosts. Viruses are very good at making new genes and viruses contribute genes to hosts, but they also take genes out of it. So the evolution of the whole viral world is that kind of symbiotic, constant uh, symbiotic interaction with all the different hosts as the hosts evolve. Wait, how do viruses take genes out of host? Well, well, when the virus replicates inside the host, it's very, you know, people say virology must be dead simple. I wish I could show you a book. I got two books here. They're called Fields Virology, Volume 1 and 2, and they're massive. They're like, you know, the old King James Bible. They're much bigger than that. Viruses are, are very small, but they're not simple. They're very complex. As people are discovering now when they're studying the coronavirus, it's actually very complex. There are aspects of how it replicates that we don't even fully understand now. They, they, what they do is they, they either, uh, like the, uh, for instance, the retroviruses, they actually enter the genome and use the genome to make more viruses, or they enter the sort of translational properties of the genome. And the coronavirus is an RNA virus. What that does is it gets into the bit of the cell that makes protein. They, and they're called the ribosomes. They're, they're protein manufacturing factories. That virus, when it gets into a, a human cell, often a lung cell or a cell in the respiratory passages, it actually hijacks the protein manufacturing of the cell. And it makes the first protein, it tells that protein ma- factory to make, is the protein that will enable the virus to replicate. <laughs> so it actually tells the protein factor, you make this, and when it makes it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's an RNA a protein that enables uh, the RNA genome of the virus to copy it, and it tells it's, the uh, ribosomes to make that. It tells the virus, the, you know, the ribosomes to do that. Once it, done, it does that, the virus starts self-replication in, in the cytoplasm of the cell, in the ribosomes. Right. Do viruses show any signs of any of life when they're not, you know, attached to a cell? Like, it, has anyone looked no. at the moment of interaction of a phage with a bacteria or a oh, virus? Oh, yes, they have that. Yes, cell. yes, they'll what do happens? that. The, the, the thing that, move, you know, the, when you see the pictures of virus, those pictures of viruses in the in, in, books or electron microscope photographs, the sort that I took way back as a student, what you're looking at there isn't the active phase of the virus. You're looking at what's called the virion. The virion is the mobile phase. It's the, it's the structure a virus makes in order to move out of the host and find another host. And so it's, it's got only that single, it's got the viral genome in it, and its express purpose is to go out, to leave the host, and find another host and start the cycle all over again. That's, so people call that inert. It is inert in that it's not, there's no chemical process happening in it. Uh, but I would compare it to the seed of a plant. The seed of a plant isn't a plant on its own. It's the potential for a plant. And when the seed finds a, a fertile bit of soil or whatever it is that it needs, it then throws out a shoot and starts developing into a plant. Now the virals, the virion does exactly that. <clears throat> they, they, they bud off from the surface of the cells and the respiratory passages in this case, where we're talking about the coronavirus. And when the person coughs, billions of viruses come out into the atmosphere around the host. And their aim is to find others, to, to start the cycle all over again. When they, when they meet another, they're inhaled by someone else. It'll go down their respiratory passages. It's got things on the surface of the virus. There are those spikes and other things. When they come into contact, they're looking for the target cell. And the target cell is a cell lining this respiratory passage. When they find the target cell, the virus will stick to it. 
it'll actually find, it's already pre-designed by its genome and its evolution to go through it, to penetrate the cell wall and to enter the cell. And as soon as it enters the cell, the coat of the, vir of the virion releases everything in it. It just pops and the uh, genome of the virion then begins to do what it needs to do. And in this case, with the coronavirus, what the genome does is it's looking for the ribosomes, which are in the cytoplasm of the cell, and which normally manufacture protein. It latches onto the ribosome but, but again, and starts again. You, you, you're saying that, okay, so when, when, it's, when it's in its virion phase, it's looking, it's seeking, it's... it's it's really just passive, but it happens it, it is, to... It, it, it's passive, you know, but it's... But it, as part of the viral evolution, it deliberately irritates the lining of the throat, the lining of the uh, respiratory passages, so that the person who's got the virus multiplying in them it feels compelled to, to cough or to sneeze. If it's flu, it's coughing and sneezing. With the coronavirus, it'll be mainly coughing. So the, person's, the virus is irritating the lining, which makes them cough. And by doing that, it's forcing the host to eject them uh, into the ambient air where they can discover other hosts. So it's, it, it isn't entirely passive because it does something to the host to make it do that. To, but it's instance, doing it in a passive coughing. way, oh, yes, not an active the, way. The, the virion is passive in the sense that it's got no chemical activity going on inside it. It's solely, it's like a little mine, landmine that's just flung out when people cough or sneeze. And it relies on the fact that there will be someone in the vicinity or it might land on a surface and people might pick it up in their hands and transfer it to the mouth, to their eyes or something, and then it'll go through it. Some, some viruses don't okay. always en enter the, you know, they enter different parts of the body, but they have ways of finding. What they do is they say, how does the virus find its target cell? And nearly always the target cell is a cell of the immune system or else a cell of the immune system carries it. To where the virus wants to get to. So the, it, the virus is so constructed that it knows, it doesn't know, but its evolution is determined that when it gets into the body of the host, that this immune cell will actually find it, will search for it and find it. And when it does, that's what the virus wants. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. Well, Frank, you know, uh, uh... I'm sorry, we're out of time. This has been an amazing call. What's um What's the best way for people to f learn more? What What are your two books well, that they should look at again? The, this new the uh, Virolution is all about virus evolution, as you know, because you've read it. I wrote a book years ago called Virus X, which was the first. That was the thing I wrote about. I went into plague zones, and that's with the hantavirus. The first 120 pages of Virus X is about the hantavirus. But the new book, Virosphere was written really to show ordinary members, when I say ordinary, I mean non-doctors, non-virologists out there, how viruses actually work, because I think they're very interesting, and that ordinary people might find them interesting. Well, I, I hate it. I'm, I don't, I'm not sort of putting people down when I say ordinary, I mean non-clinical, non-scientific readers might find viruses interesting, because <laughs> I think they're very interesting. And non, non-virus lovers, right? Yeah, well, non, people who are not involved in it professionally, but have, have a curiosity. The, what you call no. an intelligent non, non-virologist, if you want, might actually find viruses very interesting. Yeah, well, I do. I do for sure. Well, Frank, this <laughs> has been, like I said, fantastic. Thank you for coming. It's been a great call, and, and uh, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com.